So this morning on Lisa's live stream, we had a really great conversation about a lot of the stuff that's been coming out with, you know, the trial, the DOJ and uh, Penguin Random House trial, some information that's come to light, um, thanks to publishers being forced to testify under oath. And also, of course, you know, the whole Barnes and Noble thing that went down recently and is still quite the hot topic. I am not, this is not going to be really a recap video. I just, I haven't had the time to do kind of like the deep dive research or anything like that. I will recommend Jess Owens has been putting out some great videos about the DOJ trial that I will link down below. I made a video about the Barnes and Noble stuff last week. And oh, actually I did get a comment from a Barnes and Noble bookseller I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, she said, um, I work at a bookseller at my local BNN. While they didn't make a public statement, they did address the controvers controversy, not really, to us as booksellers. I can't quote it to you verbatim, but essentially it told booksellers to post if we want to on our local socials, but not to feel pressured if our pages are seeing some of the backlash, made it clear they won't be releasing a public statement. And they said the conversation was, quote, too nuanced for social media. Everyone can make of that what they will. But first of all, thank you, Erin, for uh, letting me know. That was really interesting. And I'm not going to fully unpack all of that, but I will say I find it hilarious that Barnes & Noble said the conversation is too nuanced for social media, but also made it clear that they are just not going to write a statement in which they could have as much nuance as they want. So I don't know, yeah, like Aaron said, make of that what you will. Then recently there was this tweet that really kind of went viral in our little publishing author reader part of the internet. And we did talk about that on Lisa's live stream today. And it said out of about 58,000 trade titles published in a year, half sell fewer than a dozen books. Um, and Again, I'm not doing the deep dive research into this. I, I don't even remember exactly what the source was on it. I will try to look up what I can and link to it down below. But I will say this, even though the tweet doesn't say new titles, I think a lot of people read that and just assumed, oh my God, half of the books that come out that are brand new in a year sell less than a dozen titles. But of course, remember every year there are novels that were published years or even decades ago that are still getting printed. I mean, just as an example, my very first novel came out in 2014, sold a few thousand copies that year. Now it's probably selling less than a dozen <laughs> per year. I mean that, so like take all of that with a grain of salt. What this video though is going to be about is the fact that combining the Barnes and Noble news and all of the information that came out during the trial, which again, not going to rehash it all, but the short, short, short version is that publishers were basically forced under oath to admit that they don't actually have a business plan or really understand how book selling works and acquiring and sales are all just kind of a big crapshoot. It's really, really great. Um, I'm seeing a lot of just kind of, I don't know how to say it, doom and gloom from authors, both aspiring and published about why bother anymore? We should just try, traditional publishing is dead. Blah, 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 blah. And of course the, the classic, you know, obviously you're an absolute idiot at this point if you want to be an author and you don't go with self-publishing. <laughs> so I want to talk about all of that here. The title of this video was 100% clickbait because, or not clickbait, but it was sarcastic. No traditional publishing is not dead. This happens, I swear to, every year I feel like there's just new reasons that come out where I, traditional publishing is dying and it's like, no, it's not dying. It's just changing. It's always changing. It's just a matter of what it's changing into and we don't know and that uncertainty is what is fueling all of the panic. So what I want to do is I want to have a little chat with you if you are an author aspiring or published and you are feeling like I don't think this is the right path for me anymore. If you wanted traditional publishing and you're not sure whether or not you want to pursue that anymore, I'm not trying to talk you into it, but I just want to have like a little bit of a pep talk and a little bit of a reality check. So first up, I want to start with the DOJ trial. So again, not recapping it, but essentially what we learned is that major publishers don't really have any rhyme or reason on paper documented that they can show for how they make decisions in terms of acquisitions and sales. Like 
it's just kind of the wild west and always has been and there were a lot of kind of eye-popping statements like ceos acknowledging that a solid mid-list author is long-term more profitable for a house and yet admitting that they continually choose to throw ungodly amounts of money at a very small fraction of books the majority of which of those will never earn out those advances so i totally understand if you've never if you are new to the industry why this would make you feel really defeated but here's the thing about this trial to remember nothing has changed publishing has always been this way and people who have been in it for a while we have known <laughs> that it was this way and it was just this complete lack of transparency and that's why I'm very grateful to both the trial for forcing publishers to come out and forcing transparency finally and acknowledging what all of us have already known and to authors who have been year after year getting more vocal about speaking out against their own publishers and calling out things that are wrong and bringing all of this to light. Nothing has changed, it just got dragged into the light. And that's actually a great thing for you, especially if you're an aspiring author, because I have to tell you, I remember when I got my first book deal, I was in a debut group, a bunch of kid lit authors who were all had debut novels coming out in 2014. And when I think back to the conversations happening in those forums, oh my gosh, it's, it's frightening. There were people who got like, say, a contract for two books and like a nice, not crazy, but nice advance, quitting their day jobs. Like that was it. And, and it, looking back on it, it's, it's so obviously a terrible decision. But at the time, a lot of people didn't get it because it was like, well, you know, I sold two books for, you know, let's say, $75,000, I mean, you know, I that's that's an annual salary. I, I don't know, people weren't doing the math, people weren't understanding that, even if you got like, say, a $250,000 advance, even if you got something that split up and spread out over the years, was a pretty good livable annual income, your odds of earning out that advance were slim to none, and your odds of getting a deal at all, much less a deal that size, a couple years you know like after your book came out were really really low people didn't know because nobody talked about this and now we know now we can plan better knowledge is power so i think we should i mean i felt relief every time i read one of publishers weekly's recaps of that day at the trial i mean i was i laughed i had a lot of negative feelings and eye rolling and what the heck but mostly the biggest feeling I felt was relief because it was like, my gosh, it is so validating. After over a decade of talking about this with other authors and people in the industry kind of like behind the scenes, covertly, not publicly, it is incredibly gratifying to see CEOs being forced to admit that they don't know how their own business works because we've all known that. And now aspiring authors know that too. And they are armed with that knowledge going into it so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. Okay, so the Barnes & Noble policy changes. This is new and it sucks. I mean, okay, right now I'm, you know, revising a mystery novel that if I am able to get an agent and get a book deal, <laughs> it will be my debut in adult fiction. And based on these policy changes, it is pretty much guaranteed that even if I get that deal, my hardcover will not be shelved at Barnes & Noble, period. That sucks. 100% I agree that these policy changes are bad for authors, they are bad for publishers, and I don't understand how it's not bad for Barnes & Noble. I still feel like they are shooting themselves in the foot, but this remains to be seen. I cannot predict the future. Maybe it'll work out. Again, the guy who is making these changes at Barnes & Noble's apparently turned it around for Waterstone in the UK. So we will see. I don't know what the future holds. Maybe they'll thrive. Maybe they'll be bankrupt in a year. You're probably seeing, I know I am seeing, a lot of predictions as to what will happen thanks to these Barnes & Noble decisions. You're probably seeing a lot of predictions as to what this might mean. And a lot of those predictions are, this is the end of traditional publishing. Blah. So when I was researching my Barnes & Noble video, I ended up reading a ton of articles about 
the closing of borders back in 2011 and other pieces about you know speculating on the next decade and what it would bring pieces on like npr and the washington post like all these news outlet outlets and it was like a there was a consensus that like the few things that we we could be pretty certain of were and i don't even remember all the reasons why but apparently this was like conventional wisdom at the time was paperbacks were going to be dead in a decade like dead no paperbacks uh, ebooks would be by far the dominant um, like form of book in terms of sales numbers like way more than hardcover anything else ebooks dominating everything uh, Barnes and Nobles would be closed and gone like probably within five years they, they were saying like by 2015 2016 indie bookstores dead because ebooks were everything and uh, hardcovers would die out with the older generation who would be the only ones who wanted to pay for them and <laughs> none of that came to fruition. It actually turned out that older generations really, really love ebooks. They are like one of the largest demographics who buy ebooks. Meanwhile, younger generations, like teens, especially with YA, they love hard hardcovers. They, they want to own the physical thing. They like to go to signings and get their author, their favorite authors to sign their books. It's not what people were, you know, predicting at all. And oh, um, I don't know if you not noticed or not, but like paperbacks are doing okay. <laughs> so my point is, it was really funny to go back and read all that stuff because 2022, the way we're experiencing it right now in terms of books and where things stand, we, we did not get any of that right a decade ago. Not even close. So I feel like it's almost pointless to sit here and think, well, in 2032, you know, it's everybody's going to be it's going to be all self-publishing and, you know, Penguin Random House will surely be closed. Y'all, those publishers aren't going anywhere. It just, there's no point in speculating because one, we're probably going to get it wrong. And two, if we're going to speculate, let's speculate in a, in a positive way. What if this decision that Barnes & Noble made just leads to an absolute boom in indie bookstores, people shopping at indie bookstores, more indie bookstores opening. I'm going to imagine that indie sales are just going to keep rising as Barnes & Noble essentially takes itself out of the market for consumers looking for a brick and mortar book buying experiences, which is the one area Amazon has not been able to crack. And author events just get bigger and bigger at indie bookstores because I'm kind of thinking if Barnes & Noble is only stocking James Patterson and JK Rowling, they're probably not going to be doing a lot of author signings. Maybe publishers develop a stronger and more profitable relationship with indie bookstores and so do authors look your dream of seeing your hardcover novel on the shelf of doing a signing at a bookstore that dream is not dead it's just gonna happen at an indie instead of a Barnes & Noble by the way as a reader and I'm sure you're a reader too one way we can do this is to just support indies more now and I know that price is a barrier for a lot of people it does tend to be cheaper if you go with Amazon but I just want to offer this if you are an audiobook person and you like audible you can switch to Libro it's the exact same price you have access to all the same books and you get to choose which indie bookstore your money goes to I will link that down below so you can check it out if you want I think it's only in the US if not would my friends in other countries please let me know uh, if you can use Libru or if you have a similar app that works for you. My point is 2011 conventional wisdom told us that, you know, I think it was like libraries would all be closed or virtual and paperbacks would be dead and none of that came true. So there's just no point in telling yourself, oh, well, yeah, traditional publishing is over. I might as well just like pull the plug on my dreams. We don't know what things are going to look like a decade from now in terms of publishers and in terms of book buying habits. Okay, so a lot of commentary out there, and this is not just within recent developments, this has been going on for a while, suggests that I, for example, am completely insane at this point if I continue to choose traditional publishing instead of self-publishing. And something that has bothered me for a long time is that, okay, I do not have self-publishing experience. And I say that every time I make a video where I even breathe the word self-publishing, I don't give advice about self-publishing because I don't have that experience and I don't know anything about it. So I'm not gonna sit here and spout advice to you. However, there are so many self-published authors with zero traditional publishing experience who have no problem 
spouting lies about traditional publishing and just like fueling the fire we're already dealing with. Like, yeah, traditional publishing has hella issues, but you know, some of the stuff that people throw out there as if it's fact is like objectively not true. Now, I follow several self-published authors who have a ton of experience, who I respect a lot, and I have heard enough of them say this that I feel comfortable in also saying it, and that is self-publishing is pay to play. Traditional publishing is not, and that remains one of the core differences and one of the primary reasons people choose one path over the other. You can technically self-publish a book and pay little to no money, but in terms of having any kind of success, any kind of notable sales, you're playing a lot lottery with way crappier odds than your traditional publishing lottery. Something to consider is that some genres do much better in self-publishing um, than in traditional publishing, but vice versa is also true. So for example, I have an idea for a writing craft book series that I might want to play with next year, and if I ever were to go with it, I would self-publish it. I would want it to be ebook only, and yeah, that's the path I would choose. I think that would be the best, the best, you know, choice for those books. My mystery novel? No, I'm still going traditional publishing. That's my first effort at least. And middle grade? Look, one of the Barnes & Noble policies is was about middle grade specifically and how they're only going to be stocking brand, you know, name Harry Potter, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I write middle grade. <laughs> But I'm not going to self-publish my middle grade. I'm not saying there can't be breakout successes or successes in self-published middle grade novels, but I know that this, that traditional publishing is still a much better opportunity for me. I mean, guys, my books with Scholastic right now, they don't even have hardcover editions to begin with. And then second of all, the last one sold 160,000 copies in Scholastic clubs and fairs in three months. I am not going to reach that number of children self-publishing my book, especially at no cost to myself. So I do think genre is a big thing to keep in mind when you're trying to pursue one or the other or deciding which one you want to pursue. But I think there's like a bigger conversation that we should be having with ourselves, like you should have with you if you are struggling right now and trying to decide in light of all the recent news do I really want to pursue traditional publishing anymore? Or do I want to go with self-publishing? Or do I just want to bail on this whole writing books thing altogether? The first thing you need to do is to, and I know this is way easier said than done, stop worrying about the things you can't control and start thinking about the things you can control. I did not specifically define success for myself for the first half, three quarters of my career, several years. And that resulted in me relying on publishing to validate me which led to the longest period of burnout I have experienced to date. So I'm going to give one specific example out of many, and this is a story I've told on this channel before, but I had a two book deal with Penguin Random House. This was for Olive and the Backstage Ghost and Spell and Spindle, and that contract included an option clause. An option clause means that the publisher gets the first look at like a proposal for your third novel. They get to consider it and either make an offer on it or reject it so that you can then go wide and submit it to other publishers. And obviously your sales data on your first two books are going to greatly influence whether or not they want your option. And I knew I had kind of a slim chance because my sales for Olive and Spell and Spindle were midlist, like solidly midlist. They did not get marketing support. So I put together a proposal and I loved my editor and she loved me and I sent it to her thinking at least it would go to acquisitions and we would see what would happen. But she came back and told me in the kindest way possible that she was really sorry, but they didn't even want to see the option because my sales were just, they were done with me. And you know, I had a lot of feelings of bitterness and resentment about that. And you might think rightfully so, but, and it's true that they didn't give me, you know, a good amount of marketing and that I felt like I was being punished for something that was not my fault. But here's the thing, and this is going to sound random, but stick with me for a minute because I'm going somewhere with it. 
I feel like every couple months, like several times a year, right? There will be some celebrity or some politician who, and they have like a book deal, you know, with a major publisher, and then they do or say something publicly. And then one of the consequences of them doing or saying the thing results in their publisher canceling their book contract. And the next thing you know, they're all on the news and on social media whining about censorship. And first of all, a company deciding not to pay you money for the words that come out of your mouth is not censorship. <laughs> and second of all, every time I listen to them, I'm like, my God, you are so entitled. Literally no one, no human person is entitled to a book deal. And I'm sorry if that sounds harsh, but it's true. It's true of me. I was not entitled to a third book contract from Penguin Random House because I wrote two. It, do it doesn't matter. It wouldn't matter if it was the most brilliant book I had ever read in my life or written in my life. It wouldn't matter if Olive and Spell and Spindle had sold wildly well. You know, it wouldn't matter. I'm not entitled to that. They're a company. They can do whatever they want. And I can gripe about them <laughs> all I want, but the fact is, you know, I was not, it was not my right to have them publish my next book. And I am constantly reminding myself of that to just kind of like keep that entitlement in check because I don't like how entitlement feels. It just doesn't feel good. I get to define success for me and my books and my career. And that's the only way I am ever going to be happy. So that's really what I want you to take away from this. I think you should start, if you're struggling right now, I think you should start by getting really specific and defining what success would look like for you and your books and your career. What sales figures would you like to see? Is hardcover really important to you? Is being in indie bookstores really important to you? Is having the name of a major publisher on the spine of your book really important to you? Is that part of success for you or not? I think you should go for both like realistic definitions of success, but also dream big definitions of success. There's nothing wrong with dreaming big. And also remember, there's no right or wrong answer here. You might realize that some things aren't that important to you and other things really, really are, and that's what you wanna focus on. And then you use that, you use your own specific definitions of success to decide which path is right for you. And the great thing is you have so much more solid information, hard facts about both traditional publishing and self-publishing right now, more so than you ever, any author has ever had ever in history. We don't know what's going to happen next, so why not choose to believe this is the beginning of an indie renaissance and something just totally new and exciting for authors and readers. And most importantly, if you're feeling really down right now, but you still have that passion for writing and you love your story, just remember the only way to guarantee your book will never be published is if you quit writing. So I really hope you keep writing your story.